I must say, I must confess that my own approach to cyber also comes from a strategic angle. I've uh, pr previously worked uh, for a long time in the government sector, most recently as the director of the NATO Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence. Uh, prior to that, as the um, security policy advisor to the presidents of Estonia, two of them, and then also as part of the NATO section's uh, private uh, policy planning, the private office policy planning um, unit. More recently, I then afterwards was in a private sector working for an Estonian cybersecurity company, and now I look at cyber from the perspective of a non-profit as I work at the e-governance academy, um, <clears throat> which, uh, as one of my colleagues uh, at the e-governance academy put it, helps governments to go digital. So e-government e-governance academy proudly is a stakeholder at the eu cybernet and we are really excited about what you do so in my uh, short intervention here today i was thinking of sharing some experience from what 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 uh, i've accumulated lately from work with the e-governance academy um, where we basically work globally and of course more generally the e-governance academy helps um, uh, to various governments, uh, but also the local municipals, uh, to to put up the uh, to support the digital reform and digital transformation. And uh, my own uh, short, uh, small cybersecurity team helps with the cybersecurity side of things. So my approach is informed by what we do at the um, cybersecurity program in the Governance Academy, and more specifically by the um, National Cybersecurity Index that was created and has been managed by the Governance Academy since 2016. The uh, National Cybersecurity Index is a comprehensive tool for capacity building uh, as it provides the basis uh, for uh, governments. It, it basically looks at very, it, it looks at 190 governments um, at, uh, at how they are doing assessing their um, capacities in various fields and from that angle I would uh, uh, comes my view on what are the main building blocks in the cyber resilience um, um, uh, the National Cybersecurity Index provides so to say the theory and and recently I really personally also tested it in practice when over the past six months, uh, look, uh, have we, our team has been looking very closely at uh, the Western Balkan Six, uh, but also we've been looking at the cybersecurity mat maturity in places such as Georgia, Moldova, Armenia, and, and beyond. Uh, so, um, so what is there? Essentially, I would say uh, there are many different approaches, uh, but in an attempt to, to generalizing it, there are roughly, I would say, it, it can be boiled down to six, diff to six building blocks. It, uh, it starts first with the institutional framework and governance, which, is, um, which, is, uh, which in itself is comprised of different uh, elements. First within the governance is the political will and that's really important. It's very hard to measure, but it's very important in order to have a successful cyber transformation, cybersecurity transformation. Um, and and there's a way to uh, for for anybody um, supporting the reform to help to shape or or insert the narrative. It is already <clears throat> we are halfway there when a government appreciates digital re reform. Um, that's already a really good sign. Um, very often, of course, the governments, uh, while proudly seeking to undertake digital reform, uh, are not so um, comprehensive about the importance of cybersecurity as part of it. Uh, the politicians see, well, politicians, and it's, and it's rightly so, they are interested in more votes. In many countries, uh, digital services are really popular with the people, rightly so. Cybersecurity is uh, seen only as something that uh, sucks out costs. Uh, while, and, in, and in that case, it really is important to insert into the political narrative that you cannot have successful digital reform without um, also taking care of the other side of the coin, the, secure, the security of the digital reforms, the digital security, because people 
would not trust the services if they, uh, if they see that these services are not designed in a secure way. Um, a, a sort of like a, a advice from experience uh, to the politicians or, or to the donors talking to the politicians here is that rather than looking at cybersecurity as an area which is just uh, post, one should look at it as a garden where you invest uh, into watering the plants and taking care of the garden and then it come, gives back to you. So, uh, so that's one way of, of trying to look at it uh, into a more constructive way. Under the first building block, the institutional governance and uh, institutional framework and governance. So political will, but also um, the, um, uh, it is about um, responsi responsibility and ownership. It, be, it would be useful to see whether there is a national competent authority appointed, whether there is a successful intergovernance, interagency inter, inter, uh, cooperation, and more uh, over, in addition to the government agencies working together, it would be also important to have the government agencies working with the public sector, especially when, when it comes to, um, to the critical information infrastructure protection. It, it really is useful to have the civil society or the, or the private sector also have a platform to express their voice into the governance. And last but not least, under this building block, there is growingly the need to raise awareness about the importance of foreign policy in cybersecurity. Uh, we can have a whole different seminar about this, but, but, but uh, for many emerging economies, it's not uh, coming um, sine qua non, but, but it is an important aspect to have the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but more beyond that, main stakeholders also understand the international side international cooperation and the international cooperation diplomacy side of cybersecurity to be able to constructively um, participate in that dialogue. So that's the first building block. Secondly, there is the legal framework and national cybersecurity strategy uh, because laws and regulations really translate concepts and strategies into rules, principles, rights and obligations on part of the individuals, organizations and uh, society at large. Uh, so, um, here, I think personally, the uh, European Union, with its uh, NIST Directive and NIST Directive 2.0, present a good sort of um, template for countries uh, interested in, in reforming their uh, legal framework uh, to follow. Um, thirdly, uh, the third building block for, for me, I would say, um, you can divide it in, into smaller parts, but essentially is the crisis management system and incident response. This is about whether the government has a good understanding of cybersecurity risks to allow efficient risk management. For example, whether there is a national risk assessment procedures in place aimed for reducing or eliminating risks related to government data networks, but also to the critical and essential services. This is also, some of the examples of this could be the government agencies informing critical information infrastructure entities and pub other public sector uh, entities about acute vulnerabilities, um, national cyber risk assessment procedures, um, um, or regular crisis, or organizing regular crisis management exercises um, to put the theory again into practice, which I think is very important. Um, also, this building block uh, is about whether the government authorities, authorities as well as the private sector entities um, have the responsibility to notify the government competent authority or the national CERT, C-CERT, about cyber incidents. That is really crucial. And in light of, for example, the current war conflict going on in Ukraine where we, say, where we see an increasingly uh, industry engagement in, uh, uh, in trying to mitigate the, the results, the importance of public-private partnership in this aspect and the importance of information sharing, especially the uh, information about uh, incidents sharing between the pri private sector and the government is really crucial, not just for the developing countries, but, but for the um, EU, UK, US, uh, NATO, EU members as well. The uh, cyber threat landscape assessment um, 
is uh, is also just really important for the uh, aware general awareness raising aspect. Um, moving on, um, I've already taken a good chunk of the time. I, I'll try to 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 rush it up. Uh, the fourth uh, aspect, the fourth building block, is the critical infrastructure and operators of essential services. It's um, it's again, it's a large chapter here. You can divide it up, but but it but it is incredibly important. Protecting critical infrastructure from cyber threat in a proactive fashion should be an integral part of uh, of any digital agenda. Without a clearly assigned responsibility, it is difficult to see how the infrastructure could be mapped and a joint defense could be designed. So it's important to first map the actors. It is also very important to build trust in between this public sector and to have clear procedures about sharing information, about um, helping and supporting the, um, the industry to get better in cybersecurity um, themselves. Uh, so here, a lot of, it, it is a, a difficult field where it is much easier to say things than do things, but it uh, definitely pays off. Um, uh, then, as a, uh, there is the, the, the part of another building block, uh, fight against cybercrime. That is a very specific, it usually is for the uh, police, but also involves the prosecutors, the investigation. It is about the forensic, digital forensic skill. It is about, on the legal side, uh, the, um, um, the concur concurrent with the Budapest Convention about the 24.7 point of contact for international cooperation. This is something that, uh, an area perhaps that which is closest to the people, the citizens, because if some cyber crime happens to them, um, they, uh, they would need to report it somewhere and they would need to have the assurance that there is an able entity in the state dealing with the cyber crime, um, fighting against the cyber crime. And last but not least, the sixth uh, building block here uh, is, uh, uh, I, would, I would say, is awareness raising and education. Uh, the purpose of this uh, part is uh, to, uh, to have, uh, well, the education part, of course, addresses the shortness of the labor skill, uh, the, the shortness of, uh, of, of workforce. You need to have um, young people in the university able to, to study cybersecurity. Uh, both as a separate subject, uh, but also as a, as a part as a, uh, that is inserted into various other, both social sciences, humanitarian fields, and awareness raising uh, regards both awareness raising about the public in general, the citizens, but also more, more specifically the public uh, sector, and um, of course politicians as, as part of that, and that kind of like um, connects the circle with the uh, political will. Uh, being stronger when the politicians understand really about cybersecurity. So what does this uh, six building blocks uh, mean in sense of, uh, of skill set and where are the gaps? Um, ultimately, I think and I've <coughs> noticed, I mean, you, you need skill sets all across the palette, of course. Uh, we need uh, people, uh, um, experts who are helping to develop policy and regulations, um, but uh, um, but where I see the gap really is, is more on the technical side. Um, the uh, experts uh, who um, have the capacity to share knowledge about risk assessment, about critical information infrastructure mapping, but more importantly, uh, uh, ones who can conduct really technical trainings, technical workshops and uh, cybersecurity exercises. Cybersecurity exercises is something that I think really is a very useful way of, of training a large um, quantity, uh, intensely a large quantity of IT experts, mostly as members of the uh, CERT, C-CERTs, um, as well as, as the teams in other main stakeholders in any country responsible for the cybersecurity. Um, one of the uh, particularly useful type of exercises that I've found, which uh, I'm speaking here from the experience of the e-governance academy activities in Ukraine prior to the war. Uh, we brought uh, to the Ukrainians two uh, sets of exercises in the course of uh, uh, the year preceding the war. Um, 
there was the task-driven threat hunting exercise that trained comprehensive cybersecurity kill skills at the technical level as well as ro was raising awareness of the managerial level on the effects that the cyber incidents could cause. Um, the training objectives were uh, mostly for the blue team as this exercise is a, a red against blue where you have the red team providing the sort of live fire element and the blue teams training under the under that live fire focusing at attack detection situational awareness cyber incident uh, mm, mm, handling reporting cooperation and teamwork doing that uh, all while being under um, fire from the red team which is the uh, which in the exercise is played by the organizers so an exciting yet very very important way to in a simulated practical uh, context uh, learning about the uh, the um, adversaries uh, moves um, in in the exercises the red team at uh, red team is tr is mimicking three different adversaries the hacktivists cyber criminals and state sponsored actors and the blue teams really need to learn about the ways of how to detect uh, about uh, the opponent in their networks and how to mitigate then the effects. So, uh, sorry about going a bit longer than originally planned, but this is, um, talking about exercises always excites me and, and we, can, we can discuss more, but I'll stop here and uh, remain open to questions or discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Merle. It was very exciting and very interesting. So it's no worries about time have time and uh, we will continue this also in discussion time and uh, thank you Lina you have uh, a lot of experience in uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean region and uh, you have also long history with cyber capacity building activities uh, before that please share your ideas and experience what cyber capacity building is about Thank you very much, uh, Erki, and uh, greetings to uh, all EU CyberNet fans in the physical audience here, and hopefully we will have uh, a great many more uh, that are joined uh, uh, on the other side of the, the screen uh, online uh, to, this, um, to this session. Uh, I'm very happy uh, to be part of the EU CyberNet team and to share my experience uh, in cyber capacity building uh, throughout my not that long history, but five years in working um, uh, with two, uh, consecutively working with two EU-funded cyber capacity building projects. Uh, first, um, uh, Cyber for Development uh, project, uh, which was the first uh, EU-funded global cyber capacity building uh, project. And, uh, and now with, um, with EU CyberNet, focusing mainly on uh, the Latin American Caribbean region, where we are launching a cyber uh, competence, a regional cyber competence center in the end of um, May, uh, which aims to, uh, to become a hub and a training center uh, to not only to deliver EU best practices and, and knowledge to this region, but also uh, helping and facilitating collaboration between the countries uh, in the Latin American and Caribbean region, and obviously also collaborating with um, with other implementers and, and donors and international organizations active in the, in the Latin American Caribbean region. Um, but um, most of my views that I will share uh, on cyber capacity building is coming through, uh, living, basically living through it, um, because I have been, although dealing concretely with cyber capacity building for five years, only I've been in the cybersecurity business, so to say, since 2007, when uh, Estonia had the uh, infamous uh, cyber attacks. I was working at the Ministry of Defense at the time. Um, and then cyber became a really uh, hot topic um, uh, for Estonia. And, and this is very interesting to look at the cyber skills development perspective, uh, because in 2007, Estonians sort of became really uh, aggressively pushing um, uh, the cyber uh, security, and, and awareness about the cybersecurity, not only in Estonia, but also across the borders. And this is almost something like what happened in the past two years, where everybody became a epido epidemiologist and, and, and knew about viral diseases and, <laughs> and this knowledge spread in, in the society. So this 
similar thing happened um, to Estonia in, in 2007. And we, we managed to wake up also uh, NATO and the EU at the time, uh, pushing them to, uh, to develop and adopt um, cyber defense and cyber resilience um, uh, policies. Um, at the time, um, so 15 years ago, we discovered uh, the concept of collective brain, because Estonia is such a small country um, with limited resources, so we have to be smart on how, how we do digitalization efforts and how we integrate the very important cyber component uh, into it. And what it means uh, for a country to be cyber resilient is that you would, you would have skilled people, uh, able and willing to collaborate, uh, and you have the skilled, skilled people in, in the right places. Um, so uh, cyber resilience and cyber capacity building is inherently about the skills and about the people the intellectual capacity that is between the screen and the, sc and the chair, and, and this is where we focus at. And uh, since 2007, I've had the privilege to, uh, to observe and, and participate in uh, the development of Estonian cyber capacity through several national cybersecurity strategies, development and impl impl implementation processes, uh, developing and, and redesigning governance models, uh, exercises, um, real incidents, and, and large-scale uh, cyber attacks or cyber emergencies. Uh, and now I have been able to compare this experience with what we are trying to achieve in, uh, in helping um, EU's partner countries in, in developing uh, their cyber capacities. Um, and of course, the cultural, geopolitical uh, resource and, and historical context are very, very different. And this is uh, what it makes so interesting to observe how countries, um, these very diverse um, uh, countries approach uh, skills development and collaboration and, and community, uh, cyber community building. Um, and, and sometimes it is hard to sit back and not to intervene because you want to um, expo or you want to share your knowledge and your experience, but, but you have to be aware that this does not, um, it's not applicable to, to every context. And, and it's important to, to know always that, that cyber capacity building is not a, a copy and paste exercise, that every context is different. Um, Estonian model is, uh, Estonian model to cyber resilience is, is very, very pragmatic and, and, and simple. It means uh, minimum bureaucracy, maximum um, uh, decision making at lower levels, uh, very lean and uh, informal lines of subordination uh, and, and, uh, and collaboration and focus on, on efficiency. And having said that, I don't think that Estonia is a, is a pearl, a uh, shiny pearl without any faults. Of course, we also have issues and, and this is why we're not only sharing good practices, but also the bad practices or not, not, so, not so good practices. But we are also eager to learn uh, because um, particularly from the countries who have started later the digital transformation process and are doing things differently and are maybe um, skipping some of the steps that we are still struggling with. Um, and this is why it, when we are delivering cyber capacity building, we should not focus on the past, but rather um, be visionary and, and think what are the skills that are needed in the future. Um, because um, it's, it's very um, easy to, to, um, to focus on, on our legacy systems and models and, and, um, and transmit this knowledge, but, but this knowledge will be obsolete in, uh, in some, some years, so um, this is completely um, unnecessary. Um, and there is lots of innovation happening in the in, uh, so-called developing world and and some of these countries will definitely leap, leapfrog some of the uh, some of the um, stages where we are currently stuck at so for example in Estonia we never used uh, checks in, in banking and, uh, the, the children that are born today probably will use uh, digital currencies when they're old enough to to buy ice cream so um, there are things really cool and, and innovative things happening outside of out of Europe or or um, the uh, traditional uh, cyber capacity uh, delivery um, uh, region. Um, and um, 
when we speak about the cultural context, then EU cybernet is about pooling and sharing of expertise, and um, which means that we are not delivering uh, the knowledge and expertise from only one organization or one country, but um, that of 27, and, and not only the European Union countries, but as Erki mentioned, we also have experts uh, outside of the European Union in our, in our expert pool. So for example, in the Latin American context, we have uh, quite a few experts uh, from Latin America in our expert pool, uh, with whom we have a long tradition of, of working together, and, and they are exceptionally good addition uh, to our expert pool. Um, so what we have uh, done um, um, for our training missions uh, is that we combine experts uh, from Europe and from uh, elsewhere, from, from Latin America, because uh, these different approaches, uh, they work together very well, and it helps better to prepare the training uh, content because um, the, the perspective from the region adds uh, the reality, uh, adds the, uh, the, the knowledge of the context, and, um, and it, is, it is always um, very, very useful if the trainer uh, or one of the trainers is from the region uh, because it validates um, the, the knowledge that is tr transmitted and it, it is better perceived uh, always. Um, what we also do is that we mix um, uh, trainers uh, with different um, professional backgrounds. Uh, when you're delivering trainings to uh, public sector, it is uh, crucial that you have a trainer who has experiences in working in the public sector, who knows how the working processes are happening in a public sector organization, who knows the frustration of operating under scarce resources and, and political ignorance. And so it, it adds a, a certain knowledge. And, and then you have a consultant who, who uh, really efficiently uh, masters the, um, uh, the theory and methodology and has a, a exceptionally good way of transmitting this knowledge. So if you combine these two experts, uh, this is also a very good uh, match because you have uh, one on one side you add the uh, the sense of reality or the the reality touch, and from the other side, you you have somebody who is who can share the uh, the experience of of how to um, how to deliver the the training in a in a most efficient way. Very good uh, trainer skills. Um, so um, uh, when we are designing uh, the trainings, um, we also have to focus on on the impact that it will make to the, uh, to the receiving country and also the absorption capacity of the receiving country because cyber, cyber capacity building seen is a, is a very crowded, um, crowded uh, field. We have a lot of uh, donors and implementers there and, and sometimes we, we think that we are the only one, but, but they are receiving a lot of, uh, lot of assistance um, from multiple sources and, and there is a limited resource also in the receiving end who need to um, implement this knowledge into uh, some policies, regulations, etc., and, and actually to to um, to implement that in practice. So we have to think about that limited resources as well. And uh, it's also important that um, the outcome uh, of the mission should be something that the receiving end could feel uh, ownership with, uh, that they um, they uh, they would feel that they actually contributed to. Uh, to uh, the outcome, and that they, they were the drivers of um, of this um, uh, uh, exercise, and, and they were a very important part of this collective brain, who um, eventually created this um, uh, national cybersecurity strategy or implementation plan or regulation, because this is how it gets implemented in the end. Or the chances are much higher than if people who participated in drafting it really are interested in, in that this uh, document will be also implemented. Um, what I have also observed throughout the capacity building endeavors by different um, implementers is that there is a urge to rush things. Um, and, and of course, we all have our, our deadlines and our programs and we need to deliver. Um, but uh, this is sometimes counterproductive because every, every change needs time. Uh, and of course, sometimes we also get pressure from the receiving end that they have commitments um, for their minister 
to, to deliver a national cybersecurity strategy, for example, in you know, two weeks' time, which is, is not a, a very good deadline, never, but, but um, uh, there should be um, you know, time, to, time to intervene, uh, nations, uh, because every, um, every well, we should focus on, on the process, rather, because process is also a, a learning, um, uh, le process also has a learning element, and through this process, uh, we we help to um, to transform the trainees into trainers, and and this is also when I come look back at at my experience um, in from Estonia is that uh, 25 or 30 years ago we were at the receiving end of the um, of the um, uh, capacity building, and now we are running our own capacity building projects. So this is an example of how. Um, how a trainee can can eventually become a trainer, and this is what we should encourage in in all uh, cyber capacity building um, contexts. Um, so uh, to end, I guess a cybersecurity mission is uh, is um, successful if if it's not only a well funded mission, of course it's also important, but if it's a well networked mission, um, and this is what EU Cybernet, a network of cybersecurity experts, is all about. Um, that we uh, encourage networking between the experts, we encourage networking between uh, implementers uh, and donors and, and different stakeholders that we have um, in, uh, in the EU Cybernet um, uh, stakeholder uh, community. And we also encourage um, uh, networking um, with uh, the receiving countries. Um, to, to make sure that all this knowledge um, that we are investing, uh, time and knowledge that we are investing in, into this uh, mission will be beneficial uh, for, the, um, for the recipient country. Much my short uh, you, introduction, Lina. which was not that short. No um, problem, yeah. no worries. I Thank very you. much liked your uh, takes that uh, we just don't need cyber experts uh, having uh, good skills on cyber security and uh, cyber capacity building matters. It's also very much very important to have delivery mechanisms around it. So the training skills and as you well very well, well put kind of a cultural feeling, so cultural understanding how to approach your country. Very much appreciate it. Dear audience, uh, if somebody from the audience would like to ask questions uh, before we go to Cormix and uh, yes please uh, with mic yes yes uh, I just uh, give one mic to the audience I hope it works Lila can you help me and before you ask I just uh, encourage you to also attend our poll. We started a new poll in uh, Slido, slido.com, and the uh, event code is 199199. And there is a new question about uh, what are the most important uh, think blocks of security. As uh, Erla described them very well, so and you can have your take on that. Please choose three most important for you, and then we'll see what the audience building blocks which are more important. But yes, please, your question. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, so first, yeah, your intervention on the building blocks um, found super interesting. Um, and my experience right now is that since we are already seeing so many um, incidents that also affect governmental services, some countries have not finished the first building block, like the institutional setup, for example, but already need to really you know, engage in incident response. So my first question is, um, do you have experience on or advice for countries that are really working on all building blocks at the same time? Are there kind of starting formats, things in each building block where they should engage in. And then maybe secondly, also for, for from your experience maybe, 
what are formats if you then have, for example, different experts in your country working on all those building blocks at the same time, what is a good format to connect again and again? And then how can maybe um, yeah, more developed countries assist um, without, like you said, intervening in the process? Because maybe the best practice that they found for themselves in their country or culture is not the same that maybe we would be doing in, in Germany, for example. So I guess that's two questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Merle, who would well, like to Well, absolutely, take? absolutely great questions and very pertinent. Thanks uh, for asking them. Um, well, first, regarding the building blocks, uh, unfortunately, it's not that you start with first and then you finish first and then you can move on to the second. As uh, life goes, you have to be able to, 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 to proceed in all of them. Uh, um, on, uh, but that, that's the recommendation. Um, but the reality often is different. Areas which uh, seem to be most challenging for emerging economies, on my experience, uh, deal with the uh, crisis management and incident response as well as the critical information infrastructure protection. Um, countries uh, do often start with governance and uh, institutional framework, and that's correct, I think. You have to have some sort of framework or clear understanding of, of who is coordinating these things and pushing them, although there are some successful examples of uh, when the state, the central, uh, government is not very functional, you can go around it. Um, and, and here, I mean, different countries go about different things. Uh, but, but ideally, it would be useful to proceed in all. Now, moving to the second question on, um, on, uh, on what are the possibilities of, of covering a uh, larger part and how to not interfere, I think it's important to, before donor or, or a support project jumps in and starts sort of inserting its wise wisdom upon a, a country, it is crucial to learn and understand what, are, what is the current situation, what is the culture. Uh, it is crucial to hear the local experts, to talk to them, to visit and understand, have an understanding of like where things are. Of course, the reality in that is that all different donors, before they start, they, they order their own capacity building maturity reports, which results in these poor cyber experts who are uh, small in number, uh, overwhelmed with aid, uh, having to spend hours out of their day job to talk to us uh, um, who, who come in and interview them where they are. Uh, very often they are frustrated, and I quite understand that frustration. And there is this balance that they need to strike about uh, time they spend with uh, outside experts uh, trying to learn their culture and the time they spend in actually protecting their systems. Um, uh, about what kind of formats uh, try to check most bo block, uh, boxes, uh, I think exercises are useful in that regard because when you combine the t a tabletop exercise, which is usually aimed at the more sort of people who, who use their computers for sending emails, like myself, m uh, and then the technical exercise is for people who uh, use their computers actually for work and protecting the networks, you can uh, cover large ground. But, uh, of course, this is not to say that flying in, organizing a two, three, four day exercise and then flying out um, uh, takes care of, of, a, of, a, of a whole different building blocks. Support really is about um, sustainability, making sure that whatever you do uh, is, uh, has, has, uh, has local ownership and local enthusiasm and, and is linked logically to some sort of like already some sprouts that are successful in a local ground and and uh, and really dialogue and compro and talk talking to the local people. Yeah. Thank you, Merle. Ina. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Also, add a few words. Uh, very much agree with with what Merle said, um, uh, particularly regarding that. In in theory, you have this logic that you sh there is a sequence, logical sequence of of building a national cyber capacity. Uh, starts with strategy, strategy, implementation plan, governance model, etc., and then it goes more technical. 
but usually life kicks in, as you as you mentioned. There there is a large scale incident, and you have to react, and then you know the politicians um, uh, become aware that there are you know threats out there, and that some countries usually the or in some countries cyber capacity building starts with a CSER team, and they don't have nothing around it, and you have a have a group of techies. Um, who do their everyday work very well, but then they are also tasked with different policy-making uh, um, assignments. So they have to also start developing the strategy, they have to start developing different regulations, but they don't have the, the skills and the background of doing that. But they learn into it because they, they receive assistance and, and they grow into that. Um, and this is, this is how we, we perhaps encourage uh, the, the creation of a special breed of experts who have the technical knowledge but also know how to do policy, uh, which is well, quite, um, quite an interesting combination because for a technician it is easier to, to um, I guess, learn and understand the, the policy context than vice versa um, for the policy people to, to learn to become a, a, a technical expert. So this is a, a I guess an interesting way of um, of approaching things, and, and this is how we we maybe gain uh, very um, uh, skilled and an interesting background, ha having or possessing experts also in, in our expert pool, particularly in the, in the developing context or from from the region that can can uh, can uh, share this expertise also with other countries. Thank you, Bella. Formak. Please give um, also your take on cyber capacity building blocks and then uh, we reveal the result of the uh, poll. I will. Um, I've been busy filling in the poll in the background myself. Okay. <laughs> Influencing the results, which I think is inappropriate. Thank you. Um, you know, the, the latest question about what are the priorities remind me of a conversation about what's the most important part of a car. And you know, you need the four wheels and the doors and you need the windsill wipers and you need the engine and you need the exhaust and you need all the pieces. So I'm always a person that goes tick, 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 tick. Yes, I need all those, basically. Um, I'd like to answer your question, if I might, at the end of my kind of introduction. And I'm not as well prepared as my colleagues in this area, but that's just as well because they've done a wonderful job in covering almost everything I need to say on this subject. And I totally agree with what's been presented so far. It, I started a long time ago in the area of cyber, and I, I don't even know if I like to use the title cyber, because in those days it was networking, and then it became systems and networks, and then it became the internet, and then it became all sorts of wonderful titles, and positions, and cybersecurity experts, and investigators, and forensic sciences. And we have now got so many disciplines and titles that we forget about almost what it's all about, which is bringing together a set of complex skills from uh, well-to-do, well-meaning people, and we have to achieve a, a, a way of sharing that, not just at a personal level with our colleagues and with our friends and with our families, but also beyond that into our community, into our countrysides, and then later on into other countries that we're working with across the world. It hasn't been so long ago since answer to problems on the internet was, can we turn off the internet? Then we discovered that isn't really, as we all know today, and always was, an impossibility. It was growing, it was part of everybody's life, and there's no easy way to disable that. So we move from simple approaches to a complex problem into the understanding of that complexity. Let me pause and just introduce kind of my role today so I can put it into some context. I come from a project called ESIWA, E-S-I-W-A. It's an acronym like all the other hundreds of thousands of acronyms in our world today. And it stands for Enhancing Security Cooperation in and with Asia. It's an EU-funded project which works directly with the European External Action Services. And it's focusing on six countries in Asia. Uh, those countries are India, Indonesia, Japan, Korea, Singapore and Vietnam. And they're not representative of anything except that they're very interesting countries in different paths and different approaches to the challenges 
of dealing with not just cybersecurity, because we deal with four different thematic areas, and cybersecurity is just one of those areas. The other areas include maritime security, crisis management, and counterterrorism all topics of the modern world that we live in that are very difficult, very complex, and require a coherent, coordinated response at a global level. We're looking uh, very closely at our relationship with EU CyberNet, which is why I was asked to come along today. And EU CyberNet have developed a technique of collecting all the relevant skill sets into A, a database, but more importantly, in the people themselves, and bringing those people into that database so that we can share the knowledge that they have and we can bring that knowledge and apply it with some of the countries. But I agree with what my colleagues are saying. It, it, I really have a problem with this idea of going into these countries, what we call emerging countries or developing countries, with this sense of overpowering uh, experience and knowledge that we're going to destroy them with, in a sense. And there, we need to remember, and I was talking to a colleague last night, that one of the key activities is the ITU, Global Cybersecurity Index. And for those of you in the room today, or those of you online, I recommend you go and have a look at it, because it's going to be a bit of an eye-opener for you to find that many of my countries in Asia are higher up on that index than the countries in Europe that are part of the EU. Even in my own case, my own country, Ireland, is actually significantly below some of those countries in Asia. And we know that Singapore is extremely high, Korea is very high, Japan is very high. Even Vietnam, um, in my context here, and I don't mean that, except that alphabetically is the last of my list of countries, not all the way, that even Vietnam has risen from position 50 up to position 25 in that index. So this is really about relationship building. It really is about understanding, like in any partnership, there is a set of knowledges that we have, a set of experiences that we have, and we'd like to share those knowledges and those experiences. I don't think any country in Europe has experienced what Estonia went through in 2007. That experience of being attacked, of the impact on their society services, is something that became very much part of the psyche of people you deal with in Estonia who understand the challenges and the difficulties. And they're quite happy to share that knowledge and share that experience with the rest of us. Likewise, I come from Ireland. You know that our health system was destroyed by an attack this year, which almost wiped out any ability to do health registrations, access to medical records, appointments were cancelled, surgeries were delayed, all because of an attack against our health system. And we're happy to share, fundamentally, the mistakes that we made. We're happy to tell you what we did wrong. Now, it's not that what we did wrong is earth-shatteringly unusual. What we did is we ignored evidence, we ignored information going on, we ignored the risk assessment, and we thought we would survive it. And we did, in a way, because we're still here today. The country's not destroyed. But I can tell you that some people probably died as a result of that activity, and we don't have names of them. Does that make it any less real? No. But we know that appointments for medical records were postponed and delayed. And it's, we're still recovering from that. So... I was asked today because I actually work as a project looking for experts all the time, looking for people to coordinate with me. And I was asked by Erki about to focus on what are the skill sets, what am I looking for in these people? And that is really hard. And I've asked, I don't know whether it's going to be on one of your slide polls. One of the questions is, what is it that makes a good cyber training person? And believe me, the knowledge and skill they have is the least of the things they need. And that's not to say they don't need it. They do need that. They need the qualifications. They need that knowledge in their particular area. But it's the least they need in the world that I work in. When I need them to be very mature in their approach to training, they need to be people who can open and listen to what's going on around them in the countries that we're working with. We need to understand that we are not teaching them. We're actually out there to learn as well. But we're trying to collect nuggets of important information experiences, skills, and they, as we all know, usually come from the mistakes in life, from the problems in life, from the difficulties that we face. And sometimes we have nuggets of success, nuggets that were, well, we were very lucky. We had done something and it made a huge difference to the outcome of a disaster or a disastrous situation. You know, we learned from the Titanic, we learned from mistakes in the bad way, and we learned also from a Titanic that boasting about unsinkable ships is a very bad idea. And we often talk about, in the 
world of cybersecurity, and you all know this because I'm sure you're active in that space, the world is full of people who've been hacked and those that don't know they've been hacked. The rest of us are the ones that survive in a very difficult, challenging world. In this. So when you look at cyber training then, what do we consider to be a good outcome of cyber training? It's not that they all become instant wizards and skills. We don't stop medical crisis, medical problems, because we've got really excellently trained doctors. But what we have is an ability to respond correctly to a vast range of complex problems, real world problems. And so what we're trying to do is bring those skills that we see happening in Europe. I think Europe has a wonderful story to tell in this space. So I'm a great fan of what I call the EU cybersecurity ecosystem, where we have a very strong legislative environment, followed by a range of DGs in terms of DG Connect, DG Home, uh, DG Justice, uh, data protection rights and data protection discussions, uh, data retention discussions and debates, uh, court cases around that. And then we look at the work of ENISA, Europol, CERT, the hybrid center, the competence center. We have a story that is very interesting to many other countries across the world. How do we bring 27 nations, 27 cultures, and 27 languages to come together and share a common vision? Now, not a family of happiness, any family, we have arguments and fights and debates all the time. People see that as a problem. I came from a big family, so I can tell you it's not a problem. It's a challenge, but it's not a problem. And it teaches you how to say sorry sometimes. It teaches you how to find that you're not always right. And sometimes there's multiple answers to a problem, not a single answer. So I've already extended way beyond what I thought I would say. I think the detailed conversation going on here is very interesting. I'm trying to look at the whole area of cyber implementation, the balancing of cyber security, cyber crime. I spend a lot of my time in the area of cyber diplomacy, which is looking at the whole supporting of state to state relationships and how we can support each other in terms of attacks and crimes and sharing of information, mistakes and disease. Thank you, Cormac. Very well put. I now reveal the result of uh, our poll. Let's see what uh, most important building blocks are regarding uh, opinions of our audience. So uh, our distinguished experts, what do you think about it? The first one is uh, critical infrastructure and uh, protection for of essential services and this awareness raising and education. Third one is crisis management uh, and incident response. Fourth one is institutional framework I was talking about it a lot. Legal framework and national cybersecurity strategy and fight against cybercrime. And I'm just uh, a little bit surprised that the fight against cybercrime is the last yeah, one. Me too. I'm going to jump in here and go first if I'm not too rude. <laughs> um, I spent a lot of my life in the area of dealing with illegal online illegal activities, particularly in the area of child abuse online. It's very interesting for me that it was the one area that we got the whole world to work together on because it's an area that every country in the world does not accept or tolerate the children. And so I am also surprised to see fighting cybercrime at the bottom of this list because it's usually the thing that motivates, motivates that need to cooperate. Children can be abused in Europe and then the information shared about that in other countries around the world, and mostly vice versa as well, where children are abused in other parts of the world. Assumed Europe. So cybercrime is an issue that brings us together. But I think this, the, the, what I'm seeing here is a, an increased level of sophistication, a realization that there's such a broad element beyond just cybercrime. Welcome the poll. Any comments, uh, Ina? Yes, I agree that I am also surprised that cybercrime is the last, but maybe because it's a cross-cutting topic, it actually is connected to every other all the other four topics there as well and critical information infrastructure protection obviously is the first uh, element because it is critical right so this is that supports all our <laughs> our it's life it's very critical so this <laughs> should be first yes <laughs> critical always uh, should uh, should should come first um so it would be also very difficult for me to to pick um, uh, or uh, uh, prioritize that list i guess everything is important yeah Merle, your take. You stressed in your opening notes that very much uh, awareness raising. Maybe 
well, come at I all to that? I try to stress that everything is important, and, and in that sense, it is difficult to to choose. Uh, but uh, but but at the end of the day, uh, yeah, you uh, politicians, countries, when deciding about how to divide up money, uh, there 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 are decisions to be made. But but by no means one can um, leave out any of this uh, in this list. Um, yeah, I actually wanted to comment, I don't know how much time we have left, but uh, something that Lena earlier said uh, really uh, resonated with me when you said that um, it's not just sort of this dialogue of us to them, but it re really is about uh, um, finding among various regional um, uh, regions some, uh, some ways to uh, kick off a dialogue in between the countries. Uh, just as Estonia was a recipient of of, uh, of advice and consulting, and and the fact that it shouldn't be uh, necessarily the West talking to emerging economies, I very much subscribe to uh, the the understanding and knowledge often is best uh, gained when learning about how to do things on a shoestring. And one example that comes to mind. Uh, for, for example, is the Armenian uh, criminal cyber police uh, immensely enjoyed their, them, their lessons learned from their colleagues in Ukraine, um, from the Ukrainian criminal cyber police. Ukraine uh, um, cyber police uh, unit is really able. I mean, both are countries where there is a lot of cyber crime, and, uh, and they um, were able to talk to to each other and learn from each other. So when arranging these study visits or fact-finding trips and, and linking up, I think it's very important to find within the area ways to link up countries so that they could learn from each other's best experience. Thank you. As we are talking today about you cybernet and 200 plus experts uh, around it, uh, what do you think, uh, what's, what should you cybernet do right about building this community and being experts, utilizing them for missions? What are the kind of uh, key factors uh, cybernet should right? Cyber capacity building, effort. I, uh, throughout the years, have come to appreciate, uh, maybe it's an Estonian way, concreteness, um, clear uh, expectations, um, so that to have um, expectation management, to know um, a clear vision, what, what is there, so uh, what is there for the experts, uh, what's in it for them, what's in it for you, and how can the two parts come together? I think that's uh, something that you do well, but it definitely is something to keep an eye for, to continue doing. Thanks. Ormak, any insights from you? You also stress that uh, it's a useful tool, but what, what can we do better? Well, I think you're doing a great job. We can do better at the start of that is to do more of this, because we want to increase that number. So I, I think more is kind of not better, but it's better. Um, I also, I mean, I, I don't want to make it sound that we need an exclusive group of people skilled and highly trained, because I think all of us, in some level, that way I want to encourage people to understand there's so much they can do themselves. To there isn't a rocket science at the Or does it feel safe in the sense? Um, it is really a simple process to do most of the ordinary people. It does get complicated when you're running complex national based health systems, for example. I, I acknowledge that. And that requires more effort. That's the end. But to look at the ordinary user at home, the ordinary user is data technology, iPhones, and what they can do to avoid being hacked, what they can do to their banking system, it's not just the role of the bank. So I guess what I want to say is I don't want to make it so elite specialist that people are part of this system, because they are. 
child abuse network it was the ordinary youth, <coughs> ordinary parents, ordinary people that did more to protect. Thank you. Any more questions from audience? Yes, thank you. Yes, good morning. Uh, I'm Julian. Um, how do you choose your experts? Because you speak a lot about experts, but how do you choose them? And uh, I think there is a lot of experts listening to the conference this morning. Um, so do you have any advice to join directly your EU, um, EU network? Thank you. It's maybe a question to me. The procedure for experts uh, to join EU Cybernet is... Uh, expressing their interest and uh, having uh, also two recommendations from other cyber experts. So we have this kind of a vetting or background checking part of the procedure itself. It's quite easy. It's uh, on our home page. You can uh, fill out the form, put your CV and your recommendations, and then we will decide and do this background. And as uh, we saw from this schema, uh, uh, it's very important we need more technical experts. Uh, the yellow part of this uh, matrix shows that uh, there are not so many uh, technical experts available, expert pool. So it's uh, important that this part of uh, that skill set pool will be. Procedure is quite simple. And there is no exam like that. It's just uh, yes. I add, it's just uh, there's also a second thing that you're part of the system, you're part of a database. But I pick experts for activities, plan the activities in a certain country, put together a strategy in terms of skills we share at those. We look to define the type of experts. Then do an open call for evaluate the responses from the against the evaluation is very complex and very difficult. It does take a period of time to do the analysis and then later to learn from that. So there is a phase where it is. So, if I was doing an activity last year, confidence piece, I would actually call for experience of having worked with when I get the responses. I Questions against that. Sounds very precise sometimes, but generally, hoping that might. And maybe I just uh, uh, ask Lina uh, to kind of uh, show some uh, examples or share some examples how experts are exploited or utilized. Yes, there is no intention to exploit anybody. <laughs> it's free will and uh, the experts actually get a reward too. So we, we actually are able to pay <laughs> the expert fee as well for the, uh, for the experts uh, that are participating in EU Cybernet um, missions. Uh, an overview of what we have done recently, uh, our focus in, in the Latin American Caribbean Cyber Competence Center um, has been on cyber crisis management and uh, risk assessment. So we have assisted uh, several countries on conducting uh, their national cyber risk assessments, which is a lengthy process. This is why I mentioned earlier that you have to be patient because you engage all the stakeholders and, and, and learn from them and, and make sure that they're happy with uh, each and concrete step in, in the process. 
and the other is cyber crisis management where we we focus on um, helping the countries to develop their cyber emergency response plans uh, and this engagement um, eventually um, ends with a national cyber uh, cyber uh, security tabletop exercise to validate uh, the cyber emergency response plan and the other area where we focus on is uh, implementation of national cybersecurity strategies because um, there is a lot of assistance globally from different implementers on um, how to develop national cybersecurity strategies but our focus is on 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 um, on the implementation element so we we group uh, different experts from different backgrounds different countries um, and um, hope that they can share uh, their expertise in implementing the strategies, developing the metrics, um, explaining how important it is to budget the, the strategies well and, and how, to, how important it is to, to set realistic uh, time frames uh, for the strategy. So these are the, some of the concrete examples. Um, and uh, as was earlier mentioned uh, by Madeleine, that uh, there is a dire need for technical experts. But of course, this is, doesn't mean that we would not need uh, uh, that we only need technicians <laughs> because sometimes uh, I hear um, from from our recipient countries that cybersecurity is very 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 expensive because a CISO Chief Information Security Officer needs all the certificates CISP etc. So you, in order to hire that person, you you know you have to have a qualified expert. But um, experience from Estonia shows that um, the the certificate doesn't really um, show your skills. And you can be a, a very, very excellent CISO without any certificate. Um, but um, well, coming back to that, that it's it's not only the fo well, although this is yellow, and we, we really hope that it will go green uh, soon. Uh, but we also uh, also are, are are still not hiring, but but expecting experts to join, also who have skills in in the other uh, areas. Thank you, Lena. Now, as we are coming to the end of the workshop. Any questions from the audience? Thank you. Distinguished uh, experts, please uh, just uh, wrap up with uh, some final thoughts about uh, what are the most important takeaway from your point of view, what the participants take at home. Maybe I start with Cormac. Thank you. Um, I think that everybody can contribute to this. Thank you. Thank you. Taking part in the community in one or other way. Thank you. Well, expanding on that, I am a keen believer of uh, the individual responsibility of some basic cyber hygiene. So I definitely echo and agree with that, that we can all uh, do our part uh, and make sure that our children and our, our family members behave in cyberspace in a responsible manner and, uh, and undertake some basic cyber hygiene principles. Uh, regular patching, um, two-way, uh, two-level authentication, um, knowing, uh, updating uh, the, the uh, knowing what, what's, what, what are the threats there, and so on. Lina. Well, nothing to, to add, really. Everything has been said. So please join our pool and, and hope to see you soon in, um, uh, in Dominican Republic in, a <laughs> in one of the missions that we do in uh, really exotic and, and lovely places. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, audience, uh, taking active part and asking questions. And uh, make, uh, let's make the uh, world more secure. Capacity building. Thank you.